Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. What's up, guys? Who's a good color for you, man? You don't have to say that. I know it's all BS. No, it's not. It's a good color for you. Thank you so much. Good to see you, man. Likewise, uh, am I, uh, is my, uh, is that good? I think you sound great. Sounds good. Um, so Dr. Mike, this is Derek Hansen. Derek's been uh, my podcast partner for probably four or five years now. Uh, more of just a fun conversation. Pat, um, Derek, um, knows Pat Davidson really well. He's really good buddies with him. Pat's gone to a bunch of Derek's courses. Derek was just at Pat's course in, in Cali. Um, Derek's, um, in my eyes, one of the pre premier, running mechanics coaches on the planet. He's phenomenal. Uh, he's based out of um, Vancouver, Canada. And um, listen, man, this is just a fun, loose conversation. I want to bring some, you know, more recognition to your site and everything that you're doing. Because, you know, I really believe that um, out of people in the industry doing what they're doing, I, I, I hold you at a very high, at a very high regard there. So uh, love what you're doing. And, and again, appreciate you coming out to the barn a few weeks ago and, um, you know, having that conversation and, uh, it's just been great getting to know you lately, man. Dude. Thank you so much, man. Derek, how are you? Good. Nice to meet you, man. Heard, heard a bunch about you. So interested in asking some questions and, um, getting your thoughts on some things. I can't wait to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so just give it a little background. So you're, you are the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization. Um, yes. correct. Can, can you explain Renaissance Periodization a bit? Yeah. So we actually just technically rebranded to RP Strength, so it's yep. easier to say. Um, we started the company because we saw a lot of meaning, well-meaning people that were intelligent and wanted better physiques and better health getting kind of ripped off by people who didn't really know any science, weren't really curious about science, and just kind of went on tradition and just did stuff that didn't make any sense. And so we started coaching folks in nutrition and coaching folks in training, mostly for body composition, we coached a lot of athletes. And at the time that we started the company, I was actually getting my PhD at East Tennessee State University. And we were we had an Olympic training site there for weightlifting. And I started helping the weightlifters with their diets and their um, water cuts and stuff like that to make sure they made weight. And then so that got us into the weightlifting space, which then got us into the CrossFit space. And we helped a lot of CrossFitters with their diet and training and got a lot of people in the shape. Eventually, we branched out more into general physique stuff. We eventually got so many clients ourselves, we had to hire other coaches. At some point, we had a lot of the same kind of emails and questions from clients of, why do you do your dieting like this? And why do you do your training like that? So we wrote a diet book and then later a training book to kind of help people understand our perspective on things. And while writing those books respectively, sort of realized that uh, part of the book chapters were kind of how to design a training program, how to design a diet. And uh, I realized at the time that this could probably be accomplished uh, by a computer program. And so at first we launched the uh, RP Diet Coach uh, Diet app. And then uh, recently we launched the RP Hypertrophy Training app. And uh, those are apps that cost like a dollar a day and they can help you make your own program and guide you via Expert System AI to do a real good job. And the app kind of listens to your feedback and tells you what to do next based on that. So now we run a company that's actually technically a software company at this point. And recently we've had some success on YouTube. So I'm on YouTube making jokes and trying to teach people science and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. so we have a, a big team of coaches and all that in addition. And uh, it's been uh, a lot of fun, I guess. So time, time flies. Yeah, and, man, it's, uh, been, it's been great to see your journey. Now, I think YouTube is definitely um, where I first found you. Um, I think one of the things that I love is that I don't want to say that you're controversial, but in a way you challenge people. And I think you challenge people in a very fair way. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I'll quote Lane Norton. He keeps using the word charlatans out there and I'm dying when he uses it because it's really funny. But I also think, you know, as, as someone's a purist and I have been in this industry now almost 30 years as a coach, um, I want to see, I, I, I want to see the separation, right? I want to see who the real coaches like you are. Um, and I want P I want in a way, yeah, to, it's my job to expose the people who aren't, no, it's not my job 
but I sure as hell like when the fingers pointed and it's like, all right, you know what? They, you know, they're um, making shit up. I mean, it's really happening in the industry now. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away how it's not even like, well, I'm giving you my opinion. There's a level of certainty that I don't even want to call them coaches. In a way, they are influencers. Are, gurus. Are, are, yeah, guru. Thank you. Much better. Gurus are coming on and they're delivering a message in a level of certainty. And um, I, I, I think it's dangerous. Yeah. It's uh, people, the, the people that I tend to focus on the most, it sounds really, uh, <laughs> really fake. I, I promise it, it's not, is um, the potential clients and customers of everyone who's trying to get fit people trying to get fit they go on to the internet or they talk to people in their gym they talk to family members over dinner and various ideas as to how to pursue fitness are kind of foisted upon them it's like hey look you should do this you should do fasting you should do steak only you should train with this kind of movement or this machine and there are various degrees of certainty presented around this and typically the people that are the most confident and to your point kind of sometimes overly certain about their veracity of their claims they tend to be the loudest and people tend to kind of if you're saying things very tentatively and very sheepishly a lot of people are like yeah this guy doesn't even know if he's right so why would i follow him and do his stuff but if you say like this is exactly how you need to do it to get the best results a lot of people kind of clasp onto that and go interesting okay I'll try this out and people get popular a lot of times through mass appeal and how they sell themselves versus the underlying science of the claims. The underlying science is, I mean, insanely difficult for people who are not educated in this specific kind of science to parse. I mean, if someone's telling me, hey, like, you should get this kind of laptop versus this other kind of laptop, what the fuck am I supposed to know which one I to get? I don't know how laptops work in the, in the slightest. And I might follow a YouTuber that does tech reviews that's just full of nonsense but there's a good looking person that speaks very articulately and is convincing and i say oh this guy sounds like he knows what he's doing and i'm dead wrong even though i'm fairly intelligent and educated in my own right so this is this problem where people who come to fitness who aren't educated in fitness specifically like you know no one's fooling you guys but you are not really consumers of fitness content you're producers of content so for most people are consumers and it just gets really unfortunate when people get ripped off and so I do have a bit of a, because, you know, I make fun of people on the channel and as I say, usually it's all, all with love and all, all love and respect, just jokes. I don't like that part really. It's funny. It gets the clicks and the views and I'm not terrible at it, but um, I, I don't like to be confrontational. I don't like to call people out, but God damn it. Somebody has got to do it because some of these people are just um, presenting a vision of the world and how to get fit and how to get in shape that is wrong and costing people time and money. And if someone calls them out, maybe it's me and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe I'm not wrong. And so what I think of YouTube and podcasts and all this other media is a gigantic conversations that all humans are having with each other. And to more voices in a conversation is generally better than fewer. And if I critique someone and I'm wrong about it, hey, you know what I'm saying? Chalk one up to them. I never claim to be right about everything and I could be wrong about anything I'm saying, including the stuff coming out of my mouth now. But if at least someone is calling out folks that may not be telling the whole truth or may have a very distorted view of reality, people can look at that and go, nah, Liver King's still right. Dr. Mike's an idiot. Or they could go, oh man, maybe Liver King has been lying to me or maybe his understanding, even if well meant, of how things work in the human body is just incorrect to some extent. And so over time, I think that helps everyone learn a little bit more and then they make better and better choices over time. Kind of a, a proof of that is um, in advertising and marketing. Uh, if you look at current uh, of uh, like best ads that occur maybe during the Super Bowl or during any time you watch TV, anytime you see commercials, a lot of commercials now are like some combination of comedic and honest where they're like, look, like this is what the product does. Here's a funny joke about it. Um, and that, that's kind of all you get. Why, why is it different than it used to be in the 1950s when mass advertising really started? I mean, the kind of shit they used to be able to say in the 50s is just straight up lies and insane claims like, man, this product will heal, fix everything in your life, saying you'll be right as rain, you'll be rich and have a career. And you're like, whoa, it's all from taking a vitamin, amazing. That stuff doesn't work on people anymore nearly as much because everyone on average is just more savvy. And if nothing else through this YouTube stuff, what I'm trying to get is get the average fitness consumer to become a little bit more savvy, to think, hmm, is this really true what this person is saying? Or is it not true? And if they become more savvy and a little bit more educated, they can make better choices and consume more content and products and services from 
companies that do a good job and are more scientifically based and maybe a little bit a fewer consumption of goods and services from at the extreme as lane rightfully calls them charlatans people like dr gundry and dr axe or just fucking liars uh and and the less extreme ends people that are a bit less nuanced so maybe we're doing some of that i never can tell mr nick shaw just uh, hits me with a cattle prod and tells me to record videos at the end of the day that's just my job is to follow orders i'm kidding sort of how do you how do you balance your your arguments with say drawing on research versus drawing on your own personal experience and making sure that it is i guess balanced and you and you're not the the guy that's quoting research papers all the time and you're not the guy just saying anecdotal stuff like how do you mix that message so that it comes across as you know a common sense credible message yeah that's a good question I think uh, there's a couple things I can say about that. One is uh, sticking to critiquing things that I have roughly an expertise in and staying away from critiquing things that I don't know much about. So like you won't see me critique beauty products because I just don't know anything about like why women put cream on their face at all or what it does. So you won't see me saying anything about that. So staying in roughly your expertise lane helps you at least know what you can and can't say. Another thing is if you uh, have evidence available to you, both formal scientific evidence talking with other top athletes and coaches, doing a lot of observational analysis where you just look at a lot of stuff and kind of uh, aggregate metadata in your head all the way down to your own personal experience with other clients and athletes and your own personal experience of your own body. You can use all of those to kind of vector in small arrows into that giant pile of stuff we call wisdom. And if it's coming from all of the sources, at least all the sources I can draw upon, it's probably painting a better picture of the world than just calling on one or the other. So if I only know the research on something, but I have no personal experience with it, the depth and likely sort of correctness of my claims falls precipitously. And so sometimes I say, look, the research on this doesn't look good, but maybe try it, maybe experiment with yourself, see what happens. I've never tried this stuff, so I don't know. It's a good thing to say, and sometimes I say stuff like that. Whereas if I'm like, look, the research on this is like, it doesn't work. I've tried it a bunch, it doesn't work. I've seen a bunch of people try it, it doesn't work. So we kind of checked all the major boxes. So it's always good to draw on every one of those things that you can, just make sure that you're at least tacitly and sometimes explicitly calling out the fact that like, look, the research says this, but if you have personal experience that contradicts it, maybe there's something to it. Or saying, look, in my personal experience, I don't think this works. I haven't taken a look at the literature. I'm not really familiar with it, but I'm really skeptical. If you're just honest about that part, then you're not claiming to know everything. The big mistake is when people are like, the research says this, so it, period, this is how it is. Well, it takes a little bit more than formal research to conclude on things in the real world. Or some people say, look, this doesn't really work in real life. Maybe they haven't been applying it correctly or examining it correctly. And in the research, it does have a silver lining of how it works. Maybe if you restructure your program or your diet or whatever, this concept that we're talking about can work. So uh, I think a big problem is that uh, a lot of people will lean too heavily and hold up kind of as a shibboleth, as like an immutable truth, research or personal experience or anecdote from coaching. Whereas I think just knowing that all of those are limited and the more of them you can leverage, the better. So the things I'm most confident in in sport and exercise science are the things that I know very well the research about. Sometimes I'm actively involved in research in that area, like for example, stretch mediator hypertrophy and training volume and things like that. And then I have personal experience daily in the gym with these things, 25 years of training and experimenting with various ranges of motion, et cetera, rep ranges, blah, blah, blah. I've coached and trained a ton of people. I have given out a ton of information so that other people have coached and trained tons of people. And I hear about their experiences kind of in the, in the meta sphere. And then all those things combined, man, it really, I can, if someone's training for muscle growth, I can have a lot to say about it the most. With nutrition, it's a step down from there. With you know physical therapy, it's a step down again. But I will say, much of the time when we're critiquing folks uh, in the YouTube series, for example, the Exercise Scientist Reviews series, mostly it's not exactly very nuanced topics that we're talking about. A lot of claims currently being made by many of these people are so ostentatiously wrong, egregiously so, that they're just not that hard to spot. You know, it's like watching a video about someone saying, well, look, the earth is flat, and so here's how it works. You'd be like, like a fourth grader could easily refute you. <laughs> so sometimes what passes as wise advice from people is just so easy to refute. You don't even need a lot of uh, leverage or deep personal insight on it. It's just wrong from, from day one. People, for example, say the calorie balance doesn't matter in fat loss, which is like uh, something that will get you failed out of college in any physiology class. 
And so it's just not difficult to do. And that's kind of, it's easy for me to be able to sort of comedically render a very low hanging fruit and say, this is bad, this is stupid, don't do it. But it also says something, uh, our industry and everything in the world is kind of always improving on average, but it says something not so great about the state of fitness information in the world where someone can spend 30 seconds refuting something with barely any knowledge about it because it's just so damn wrong. A, a really easy example is, um, you look at, uh, you know, canola oil, for example. So canola oil uh, is, uh, a, I believe, a, a, a byproduct of uh, rapeseed. And, uh, you know, people say, you so I say, I eat canola oil, and they'll say in the comments, oh, my God, you're poisoning yourself. Canola oil is terrible. It just takes roughly five minutes of PubMed search to find every single article ever written about canola oil, every single study, and uh, actually uh, at least one meta-analysis. And it says canola oil generally seems to be very healthy in all the studies we have so far. So it's like, where did you guys get this, that it was bad for you? Someone said well, they're it. Just recycling. I mean, they're just recycling. They're, recycling. they're yeah, yeah. I, I really believe that's what most uh, people sure. are doing. And I, I think sure. a lot of my frustrations sometimes stem from the 23 or 24 year old trying to give, you know, words of wisdom on life. It's like, all right, well, you've, you've never failed a business, you've never started a business, you've never buried anyone, you know, significant in your life, or you've never brought yeah. life into this world. Yet you're trying to give advice to a 50 year old on on how to live life, and I, I I do think it's gotten a bit out of hand. Now on the other hand, it's like I think the resources that we have at our fingertips right now are amazing. Think about it. Like yes. I would never have learned about you if it wasn't for the web. You sure. know, I wouldn't be learning from you daily if it wasn't from the web. Right? We wouldn't be inviting you on here if sure. it wasn't for the web. I, I I just really believe that I, I I'm hopeful that one day there's a level of quality control. Right? Like where if you're getting a job and you have a resume and you have to go in and you have to actually, you know, audition for a position or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I really hope that a lot of what's going on in social media, there will be a level of quality control. My question to you is um, how would you, or maybe you've never thought about this. Are there any standards you'd like to see put into place to where the general consumer is going to be protected a little bit more because it's not their job, right? Like, like let's let's face it. Like, you sit with some financial guru for the next three days, and they're in your head and they're steering you in a sp specific direction. I don't know whether you know, it's finance is a bad example because you may know a lot about finance, but let's say you don't. You might sit there and you might believe what he's saying. God, sorry, my thing just jumped off. Um, you might believe what that person's saying because they're just delivering it in a way that's intelligent. They're delivering it in a way that's that has a level of certainty to it. And you're going to start drinking out of their hand, right? Or maybe you're a bad example. Maybe you're not, but maybe someone else is. Sure. What would you put into place right now to really protect that individual you know, living in the middle of nowhere who just doesn't know fitness and doesn't know nutrition and they just want to be steered in the right direction? But now they're saying to themselves, I don't even know who to listen to. Yeah. So what I would say is... I have a slightly controversial, maybe very controversial opinion on this. I love it. Um, it's uh, easy to imagine regulation as a problem solver, but what it really is is it changes the scope of the problem. Okay. The obvious effect of regulation that somehow qualifies some people to be boosted more in the algorithm or to be allowed to post at all or have opinions at all publicly versus others not, or get some kind of green check mark for you're an expert and you know what you're doing, if that comes from top-down government regulation, the good news is that it's almost certainly going to reduce the amount of low-quality information. The bad news is it comes all sorts of really nasty costs. There's an enforcement cost. Uh, there's a huge sorting and labeling cost. Somebody has to figure out what's bad information and what's good. The other thing is governments tend to be not so reliable in being objective. I mean, you know, a lot of times when government agencies in charge, they just kind of like they have regulatory uh, constraint. They have regulatory momentum. Yeah. Like we've yeah. been saying this for years and just... Even though it's not true anymore, we're just going to keep saying it. Also, regulatory capture is a thing. You know, if if I have, you know, if the most powerful, you know, governing body in the world endorses veganism, uh, then it, everyone's going to be fucking vegan by rule of law or some shit, and they're going to promote veganism. Uh, I remember back in the '90s, late '90s, there was a huge fraction of vegans and vegetarians uh, at the time, vegetarians, but now vegans in the nutrition profession. And so my textbooks in the late 90s, early 2000s in high school and college were full of just total fucking nonsense that nutritional claims way out of whack because they were just really just almost explicitly trying to promote a meat-free diet. And they just weren't handling the situation with any kind of object objectivity anymore. So what I like to say is 
I think it's fairly easy to find out who is likely to know things if you are a relatively intelligent person. So finding out what are the best practices in an industry is, is, is quite simple. You go into several industry governing bodies, for example, dentistry. Okay, there's like multiple councils of American dentistry and they all have position statements on how much toothpaste to use, what kind of brands are good, and they're generally correct. Do they make mistakes? Yes, but there are a few of them, so they're kind of competitive with each other. And so if you just look up a few, you can find out real easy what's going on. Most people do not get fooled by charlatans when they do an initial dive that takes three minutes to saying like, so what is the kind of scientific consensus industry best practice on this? They never Google that, Don. They just hear about some guy who eats only meat and gets lean. They go, that's cool. Or they fucking scroll on Instagram and they find some dude with muscles and they go, this is my guy. And they like how his voice sounds. He's funny. He's irreverent. He speaks truth to power. And they're like, that's it. What supplements does he have? I'm buying them. You're trying to help people with regulation that never requested the help. They didn't want it. So for example, to your thing about finance, the fuck would you go to some regular finance dude for? All you gotta do is read up in, a, in just an encyclopedia about how personal finance works. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, just go see a regular agent at H&R Block and set up a really like slow drip, you know, ETF account. And there I am, that's 90% hey, of the work. So, Dr. Mike, this seems so, um... Yeah, this all makes complete sense. And I'm in complete agreement with you on everything that you're saying, but like common sense just isn't that common, right? It's like, well, here's the thing. Yeah, it's just. Dude, totally. But here's the thing why are we trying to save people from their own blunders? Yeah. Like, we're trying to go out of our way, restructure the entire economy and society to make sure stupid people don't pay for their mistakes? Fuck them. You want to do dumb shit? You want to go out of the way to do dumb shit? You want to go out of the way to consume just total charlatan nonsense? Yeah. My fucking yeah. God, by all means do it. Dude, my, yeah. no disrespect, no love lost, but like, my parents will watch like stupid YouTube clips and ads from like Dr. Gundry and Dr. Axe and Dr. Oz, and they'll be like, Mike, like blueberries, they're really healthy, right? I'm like, Jesus Christ, your own son is an authority in the area. I could, yeah. used to teach nutrition to undergraduate. You, it's a D1 university. You could just ask me and I could just, you already know how to eat well. I've taught it 50 times, but they're like wide eyed and interested in these salacious claims. How, how do you help somebody like that? The thing is, if you try to help them, the Dr. Gundry's and Asses and Axes of the world, they're going to be running the regulatory show shortly thereafter. Yeah. And yeah. then what? The then, like, science is illegal and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, then, we're, bad then, we're, news. then we're in real trouble. Then we're in real trouble. No, real trouble. Point. So, good point. I'm a huge fan of freedom. I'm a huge fan of freedom of information. Everyone needs to find out. Here's another really great thing. Large language models, uh, Claude, GPT-4, et cetera, they're very, very good at presenting a very well-balanced look at most information. You can just ask GPT-4 right now, hey, can you tell me about like kind of the evidence-based ways to promote fat loss and good health. Oh my God, it'll give you a 10 point list. Almost everything will be spot on. Is it perfect? No. Is it some political bias they engineered so it doesn't say crazy racist shit all the time? That's true, but nonetheless unpatable. Yes, for sure. But like mostly it says good stuff. And that's like, that's aggregated most of the knowledge on the internet. So the experts are out there. The mega experts, the large language models are already here. But like a lot of people don't want to ask chat GPT for advice and nutrition. They want to click on the fucking picture of the dude with abs who says like you just have to eat only fucking broccoli or some shit like that. It's mostly a, a demand driven problem. Like if, if, for example, car safety, how many people are interested in getting cars that are very safe? Uh, surprisingly few soccer moms, reasonable people, older folks. Yep. Toyota Sienna, best safety rated car of all time, etc. But a lot of dudes will buy a Lambo with no fucking seatbelts in it. If you let them, are we running out of people? I know it sounds fucked up, but if you want to buy a motorcycle with no fucking governor on it, no brakes and crash, I, I got love for you, man. Enjoy. That's what that's freedom is all about. Now, if we want to help you and give you the best information, it's already there with large language models. It's free. You just ask the thing in your own natural human voice. Hey, what kind of motorcycle should I buy if I want to be pretty safe? It'll tell you everything you need to know. It's the asking that's the problem. Most people do not give a shit. Yeah. It's like giving your fat, you know, half alcoholic uncle at, you know, Thanksgiving party who's 250 pounds and 56 years old nutrition advice. He doesn't care. He's still going to have another slice of sweet potato pie. He never asked. And if you tell him all the stuff in the world, you know, you can bring a horse to water, you can't make it drink. That's a big fucking problem with nutrition and health advice. A lot of people just don't want it. You know, Derek, in your own world of running mechanics, how many top sprinters even know slash care that this is something they're supposed to be paying attention to? Maybe because their coaches told them and hired you to work with them, but how many of them by themselves would be like, you know what, I need a real deep 
insight under running mechanics and I need to really, really examine my, like, some of them will and some of them just won't. The some that will, plus or minus genetics and good preparation, they'll win the Olympics. That some that won't, sometimes they'll win anyway because they're just genetic elites. And some, what is it, like Usain Bolt ran like a damn near Olympic caliber 400 on a grass track when he was 15 years old. It's like totally insane. There's that. But then on average, over time, the people that have better practices, that take time to think, they do better and the rest of the people don't do as well. But by getting on here, having these conversations, getting on YouTube, getting on social media, promoting really good information to people, we at least let the people that are interested in science and nuance and effective results have someone to talk to them that makes some goddamn sense. It's the worst when you really want good advice, but it's not around. It was something you said earlier, Don, really hit me. The 24-year-old that thinks he knows shit, right? Pre-internet, you were talking about. Dude, if you train at a gym in Manhattan and that 24-year-old is the head trainer, that may be all the advice you ever hear about training because where the fuck else are you supposed to go? CBS doesn't talk about it. You're going to go to the library, New York Public Library, and look at books. And No, you're not going to do that. You're a stockbroker. So that 24-year-old is your expert. Now with the internet, with review videos, with GPTs, you could do way better than that if you want. But if you don't want, that 24-year-old's your fucking knight in shining armor and you're going to get everything you quote-unquote need out of him and you're going to have suboptimal results and that's your fucking problem it's your fault sorry real talk don't mean to be curt oh, I, I love it I, this is what i want d do you guys well i'll ask mike do you find yeah. that there are there is a problem with too many experts like when i was you know kind of looking at training in the 80s and the 90s there were a few people like one of the guys that was sort of became a mentor of mine was al vermeil and you could kind of look at his results whether he's with the 49ers or the Bulls, and then you listen to him talk and you're like, okay, this guy knows something. But now we're at a point where rather than a handful of experts, we have a lot of experts out there. So it's very, it, I mean, you, you kind of touched on this, but it's very hard for the average person to discern who is the expert. Um, yeah. Because they're, you know, somebody with five years experience could be claiming that they're an expert in a, in a topic. And, you know, I've been, I'm turning 55 this year and I'm like, I still don't know a lot. Like I'm, yeah. I'm still a little insecure about my knowledge base, but it seems like everybody's empowered now to be an expert after a couple of videos or, you know, or, or if their personal fitness looks good, then they're an expert. Uh, and you, it might be genetics. Like you said, how do we, how do we guide people a bit better to find out who the experts are? I think one, uh, two pieces of advice that I would give people who are trying to figure out who the experts are. The first piece of advice is there is no such thing as the expert. No one has an exclusivity to revealed wisdom and that's it. Like everyone can be wrong and everyone on the margins is wrong a lot. I'm wrong a ton. I've made tons of incorrect claims over the years. Hopefully I'm batting 500, but even that's not guaranteed. So looking for the one expert to solve all the problems short of, you know, GPTs, which are getting there with AI, uh, that's just not a real thing. Um, however, it, it is definitely a problem, as you said, that there's multiple people saying all kinds of stuff and all of them say they're experts and all of them have large followings. You're like, who do I listen to? Here's the answer to that. I would highly recommend people try this out. Follow and listen to a few of them at least. And if you really want to deep dive like you for your own career, many. Try to get all the opinions you can. And if you're a regular person just trying to get fit, at least like, you know, two to five people. And what you do is you focus on implementing for sure the commonalities in their advice. So if everyone says lift heavy-ish, push yourself hard to grow muscle using free weights and machines, pretty much 99% of experts say that. They disagree on exactly how to do that. Well, then whatever it is you're going to be doing to build muscle, sure shit going to involve resistance training and going hard and heavy and using machines and free weights. What about that other stuff that they disagree on? Well, shit, if they disagree, some of them could be very right. Some could be very wrong. You never can tell though, right? Because you're not the expert. But when there's a consensus roughly among experts, that can be just mass delusion. Uh, certainly has happened before, but the probability that's much lower than just putting all your eggs in one basket. If someone is, there's a couple other ways to tell. Another way to tell is how a person conducts themselves. So uh, I actually have a, a list of roughly 10. I don't know all 10 offhand. I could pull it up on my computer, I suppose. This would just make the podcast excruciating to listen to. But I have a list of about 10 kind of bullshit detector items, and you can use them in reverse to detect the opposite of bullshit, which is like a, a decent authority. One of them, for example, is if someone is talking in 
not guaranteed measured terms, then they're more likely correct than they are incorrect if you just don't know. So for example, if someone like this is the only way to do this and everyone else is dumb and wrong versus someone who's like, you know, evidence and and, and research and informal experience tends to tell us that this is probably the best way to do it, but I'm not 100% sure, sure about that. So give it a try and see if it works for you. I mean, that, that second person's probably going to be right nine times out of 10. The other is maybe, maybe right it's five times out of 10, maybe even worse. So if you aggregate the experts, try to get the consensus going and maybe put a few more of your marbles into someone that seems to be relatively free of ideology and relatively measured in their thinking. They seem calm. They seem logical. They seem like they're straightforwardly looking for the truth. Then like, yeah, it's dope. So for example, um, you know, in environmental science, you can have insane right-wing people that are like the environment is fine it's all leftist propaganda it doesn't matter you just hydrocarbons in the atmosphere fuck them and then you have on the left you have greta thunberg who's like a literally maybe insane person child who just says all kinds of things like if you were like hey greta what if we turned out that capitalism was better for the environment and worse she'd be like impossible i can't accept it it would fuck her whole worldview up so she's not going to admit that so okay, both of these people are probably just having a lot of feelings and you see someone a little bit closer to the center like bjorn lomborg who is like well you know like the environment is definitely a concern. We definitely want to do something. We don't shit in our own fish tank, but here are ways we can spend money the best to get the most bang for our buck and interfere less with wealth creation, which is the thing that gives us a, a chance to pay for the environment. You're like, yeah, that just seems more reasonable. And so if you trend towards the expert that seem more reasonable, absolutely, you can be lied to. Yes, still. But if an expert is pretty reasonable seeming and they seem to reflect a consensus of other experts in the field generally, especially the more reasonable ones. So, for example, if you found like 10 experts, five of them just seem way more reasonable. The aggregate consensus of the things those five guys agree on are five girls. Man, there's no guarantee. But that's a much better way of doing things than to make in the one dude. This is the most crazy batshit stuff. He could be iconoclastic and he could be fucking correct and all of them could be wrong. But probability wise, that's lower. And anything you could ever do in life is just take your best chance. There are no guarantees. Yeah, I love it. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask some really uh, bare bones, basic questions, if you don't mind. Probably super. Uh, how, easy. how dare you? I know. I know. It's not, 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 no, nothing science here. But um, so the, your demographic is, um, I, I would imagine, is it more male? Uh, so it depends. Like uh, uh, c- consumer demographic is roughly male, female, fifty-fifty-ish. Um, a lot of people who come to us from the CrossFit space are female. Uh, our YouTube demographic skews heavily male, uh, so it, it, it's it's kind of more or less fifty-fifty. I suppose now a little bit male biased, but we we uh, train a ton of females, we coach a ton of females, and a crap load of females use our product. So we we try to target m- most everyone. Yeah. And, and obviously, a, a big demographic can be bodybuilders, but you guys work with way more than just bodybuilders. Naturally, if someone's coming to you from the CrossFit space, right? Probably. Just- yeah, definitely. We're really our thing is trying to get everyone who's interested in listening to us to get better tips as to how to gain some muscle, lose some fat. That's our number one thing. It, it doesn't matter if you're an 80 year old grandmother or if you're a 12 year old kid or if you're Mr. Olympia, a lot of those folks are interested in kind of the same thing as getting leaner and more muscular. Like if they can end up looking more like you and less like me, they're halfway there. No, but you know what? It, it, it's so, it's so simple, right? Because, you know, I, I'll get, I'll get a million questions from publications like, and at the end of the day, I'm like, honestly, like, my goals and even the goals of the people that I work with, unless it's for a specific role, it's, yeah, I want them to, we want to gain muscle and we want to lose fat. I don't want to get bigger. I'm like, I didn't say get bigger. I didn't necessarily no. say get bigger. You it's never like, said your scale weight was going to go up. Exactly. Yeah. It, there's this misconception. So my question is, is that all these people come to you. Let's, let's check the box of training right now. I'm not asking for your best. I'm not asking for your top five. I just want to hear first things that come to mind. When people <coughs> over to you guys, when they come over to RP, What's like the misconception that you almost have to unwind them from? What is the most common misconception that you see most people um, are kind of bringing to you guys where you're like, well, you may want to think differently here. Yeah, definitely. That's actually relatively easy to answer. I generally hate this line of questioning, but you managed to phrase it exceptionally well. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and I'll tell you why I hate this line of questioning is, is because- I know it, why you hate it. <laughs> well, it's actually sure. part of my answer. Uh People come to us and to the evidence-based sphere looking for mega do's and don'ts. They're looking for foods or macronutrients or plans that are perfect and lead to just a panacea of everything is better, have no downsides. 
And they're also trying to look for poisons and terrible things, things that'll for sure get you hurt. So they'll say, okay, like uh, lifting weights with this technique is like injury city. We're like, well, no. And if you train up to it, it actually can be fine. Nobody wants to hear that nuance shit. Pe- uh, uh, fruit for foods, my the individual, this in the foods thing, this has to drive me the craziest. And this, a lot of people come to us with this individual food questions. Like when people are like, so brown rice or white rice? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. my God, what the fuck is wrong with you? It like, turns out, <laughs> dude, it's crazy. It's, it's a non yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a non-starter. It turns out short of actual poisons, like drinking Listerine and swallowing gallons of it, there's not any food that they sell in the supermarket that's going to poison you. And believe it or not, you can get unreal health and body composition eating one of your meals every day at fucking McDonald's. I know it sounds crazy, but it turns out they don't even put trans fats in McDonald's anymore. And those are sort of miniature low key poisons if you overdose on them. But like alcohol is literally a poison. People drink that. That's my funniest thing is people are like, I don't do brown rice because it's got lectins in it. And they'll like guzzle down half a bottle of red wine. And you're like, boy, oh boy, I hate to give you bad news here. They're ordering, they're ordering gluten-free. They're ordering gluten-free. I'll never for, forget. I was at, oh God, I was at a party and there was a woman years ago who's ordering gluten-free. Yet she's running in the bathroom to blow lines. And Dude. I'm like, how's that gluten Luckily, <laughs> Coke is gluten-free. Holy as shit. Gets. Like, no, but see, this is the fucking world we live in. Yes. It is it is fucking scary. Like people are talking about soaking their almonds because they want to release the phytic acid from it yes. and baking them and roasting them overnight at this temperature. And yeah. I'm sitting there like this. Yeah. So yet they're going out and they're pounding, you know, yeah. is that night? I'm like, what are we doing? Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. There's the same people will be like, oh, like, I don't like, I don't like use plastic bottles because of carcinogens. Oh. But to go to Cabo for you know, seven days straight and come back like lobsters. I'm like, did you know that the sun is a giant thermonuclear bomb? <laughs> just, just heads up. Uh, no big deal. So, but a lot of that is like, you know, people would say like, okay, going into the sun is bad. It's all about dose and duration and how your response is. And Generally speaking, there is such a thing as healthy foods and unhealthy foods, but also within a constraint of calories, if you eat mostly healthy foods, even there, there's nuance. You can have chips and you can have McDonald's and you can have soda and be totally healthy as long as you're not gaining a crap load of fat and a lot of weight. So people don't want to hear like, look, as long as you're eating mostly healthy foods, you constrain your calories and you have physical activity, you're 90% of the weight of everything you ever get. They want to hear magic solutions. Okay, I can eat like a total fucking cocksucker, duck fat French fries, as long as it's organic duck fat French fries, and then I can have as many of them as I want. I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not how that works. There's not poisons and there's not panaceas floating around in our environment. You just have to make fundamentally good choices every day. It's almost like asking like, how do I like get along with my spouse better? Is there anything I can do in the bedroom that's just gonna just the thing that makes everything better? Or is there things I should like never say to them that if I say this thing, it's over? No, just be a good fucking person to them and listen to their needs and express yours. But nobody wants to hear that shit. It doesn't sound like a revelation. They want shortcuts. And if you're coming to longevity and fitness for shortcuts, the only place you'll find them is the pharmaceutical industry. They're coming up with shortcuts all the time. In a few years, the drugs will get better and better. But until you have miracle drugs, you ain't got a shortcut, motherfucker. You just have to do the balanced work of being living your life in a way that, here's the thing, and most people already know this. You give me a meal, a picture of a meal that has some asparagus, grilled salmon, and brown rice. Vegans will say the meat's going to kill you. Carnivore people will say the veggies are going to kill you. Almost everyone else knows this is a fucking good meal. And if you eat triple that meal, you're going to get fat. And if you just eat one of those, you're going to stay lean. That's about as complicated as it gets. People come with those shortcuts. That's not to jump in. You can't, food has become with certain people. It's become, you know, like religious or religion. Yes. Now suddenly like I'll, I I had someone recently, it was really funny, came to me and they're like, do you eat meat? And I kind of looked at them as a joke and I'm like, well, who are you asking? Right. What do you want me to answer? Like, like, are you going to stab me right now if I say yes? Like, yeah. can we have, and I'll tell people sometimes because I'll see them coming at me. I'm like, well, if you want to have a mature conversation here right now, I'm happy to, you know, embellish a bit and we can, we can go back and forth. But if yeah. this is, a, if this is going to be like you pulling out an ax, trying to stab me right now, because you don't like my answer, I'm out of here. Like I'm, I won't have this conversation. It's really, it's really sad to add one thing before I pass it to Derek, my grandmother, and her four sisters all lived to the ages of, I think, 95 and 104. 
And wild, right? Wild. 95 nice. was the youngest. My grandma looked at 99. She actually had a sister who was 104. And the other one was oh. like 101 or whatever. Oh was it? God. I don't even know what the fifth was. But Italian um, genetics. But okay, but let's but let's talk about their what was their nutrition plan? Well, I think by you know five o'clock, you know, they were cooking by one o'clock, they were cooking pasta every day, or you know, the protein, the veg, a lot of olive oil. They were drinking every day. Yeah, they had their scotch at five o'clock. There might have been a few cigarettes thrown in there. And you well, of know, course. Right? So how could you? Yeah, not? But you know what? Like, come on. So when I when I sit and have a conversation with someone, well, you don't fast, and I'm like, no, I don't fast. They're like, well, why don't you fast? And I'm like, well, I look at nutrition as like food is medicine, and every like there's time during the day, and those are opportunities for me to consume these things that I need. And I don't want to I don't want to close down my window of opportunity because if I'm not getting enough energy, my performance drops, and all this shit drops, and it just doesn't work work well for me. And they're like, well, aren't you afraid of cancer? And I'm like, well, I'm not afraid of it. I'd like not to have it, but like, what are you saying now? If I eat breakfast, like I'm going to get cancer one day because. That's incorrect also. And then yeah. you start getting into this conversation where like they don't like your answer. No. And suddenly it becomes this parade. Well, because they've you've taken from them what they valued most. The one shortcut, simple truth that's going to be the panacea for them. They've oh. attached themselves to the idea that fasting is that thing that I was talking about. People come to us with misconceptions. That one clear, unobjective or un, un, non-subjective, totally objective answer. This is the way to do things. And all of a sudden you're like, well, actually... If you fast and generally eat well in the feeding window, you can be very healthy and have tons of energy. And if you eat six times a day and you're generally eating good food and within a calorie balance and physical activity, you can also have great health. God, it just hurts the brain because yeah. this whole time I thought this fasting thing was the, the thing. And if you're looking for the thing, that thing is going to be nuanced and balanced in most cases. And it can be simple, but it's very time, very oftentimes not as sexy as you thought it was. Um, it, it's, it's almost like uh, sometimes talking to people outside of the diet space and training space that talk to you as an expert, it's like talking to people uh people talking about cars and they only know a few cars and they, they only know the cars they've heard on media and so for example they'll be like okay 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 so like what's the best oh i'm getting sorry about that i got a alarm um they're like okay what's like you talk to someone who's an expert in supercars or hypercars as they're called now you know like lamborghinis bugattis ferrari shit like that something i know nothing about but enough enough to say the following thing and it, some guy will be like so ferrari that's the car right and, and, and someone who's educated in the matter will be like well yes ferrari's a great car they'll be like so like bugatti is a no like ferrari is the thing they're like no, no, no bugatti can be also a great car it depends on the model make year depends on your price point depends on what you want out of your car do you want like a luxury experience do you want a racing experience what well, the fuck i don't want to hear all that nonsense god damn it just tell me one fucking exotic car to buy so i can be correct but that's just not how it works so a lot of times how do people know about ferrari how do they know about bugatti they heard it in a rap song or they saw it at the dealership they don't know about like you know how many people know about the the, the pagani huayra for example this is a very interesting super exotic car it's insanely awesome mclaren people hear about mclaren but people don't buy mclarens and then so all of a sudden you're like telling them about all this other stuff they want they, they heard that the Lamborghini, that's the car. That's the hypercar that I need. And it's like, well, it turns out you really can't go wrong in this market, but you have to tell me more specifics about what you want. And a lot of these are great solutions. And as a matter of fact, if you have a good driving control system, you install fatter tires on your car and you put a V12 into it, you can take a Honda Civic and actually beat a bunch of Lambos on the track if you're a good driver. And they're like, well, I really didn't want to hear that. <laughs> so it turns out there's not this magic racing sprinkle dust you put on a car and all of a sudden it makes it better. In the same way, how, how do we get into this conversation of people talking about, well, this is the car I need. People just don't know enough and they want that one trick solution. Whereas if they went over to an expert in, in, in exotic cars and they talked for a while, they just lay out like a plethora of options. But tell me what you value most. Is it shock value? Like you want people to look at your car on the street and go, holy shit, I know what that is. Do you want a, a, a luxury experience in the interior? Like, you know, a Bugatti is not race optimized. It's optimized to have wood trim and shit. Like the wood trim doesn't make your fucking car go faster. As a matter of fact, it's heavy and slows it down. Are you interested in a straight line experience? Are you interested in, in turning more? And a lot of times people haven't begun to parse these questions. So they come to you nutrition. They're like fasting, fasting. That's the thing, right? And like, well, do you want to like get more jacked and lean and be better at sports and physical activity? And they're like, yes, yeah. so like fasting, definitely not the way you're going to yeah. do it. Like, what if you're a busy executive and you want to lose 20 pounds and you really don't like eating throughout the day and it's annoying, but you have big dinners every night. Hey, fasting is great for you. Oh, but that one extra question of nuance just pains people so much when they've already attached themselves to what they think is the correct answer. So.
it's tough to have the discussion now, really. It, it's sad coming from someone like me or someone like you because you know it. It's like the person who approaches you in the party and they're like, do you want to know what I do? And you're like, well, not really. Not really. <laughs> you're going to tell me now. I guess, I guess so, let me pull up a chair. Hold on, Derek. Yeah. I'm going to pick it back to you right now. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's so scary that food is weaponized. Uh, did anybody give you any uh, great comments about eating it in and out burger, uh, Don? Oh, yeah. Pat Davidson, I think, called me a pussy because I only had two double doubles. I think. <laughs> and, you know, to be honest, with you, yeah, but he's right. I mean, it was it was it was an embarrassing showing. I mean, I normally order three. I get two fries. I get a chocolate shake. I get a Diet Coke. I don't know what I was thinking. And I, I got to be honest with you. It, it wasn't. You know, it, it, it could have been better. It could have been disappointed the fans is what you're saying. Yeah, it just wasn't. It was it was bad. It was it was really it was, it was weak. I'm, I'm a sorry. Poor outing. <laughs> I get an opportunity to go. You got to go in. And yeah. It's like, but it's like when you it's when you play pro golf and you invite your family out to to a competition and you do poorly. You're like, guys, I'm <laughs> usually better than this. I promise. They're like, all right. I was good on the so. range. <laughs> Derek, was yeah. that a question? That was a good question. No, no, no. That, sorry. Sorry. That, that was a diver, <laughs> diversion. Um, Mike, uh, we were talking about things like little quick fixes or one-stop shop. Uh, what What's your views on something like blood flow restriction? Because that seems to be a craze now for hypertrophy. And I see it obviously used in rehab, but I've seen it used elsewhere too. And I know that some pro athletes do it pre-game for different effects and all that. Have you, have you taken a, a, a good look at that? technique and, and where does it fit yes it's also not new it's been around a long time but people here's another thing real quick and i'll answer your question directly the internet and local communities within it will go through waves of rediscovering something that's older and yeah. it'll be this new thing to them and because it's new for them experiencing it as humans they're like oh, have you heard about this thing like yes there's two years of research on it fasting it's a perfect fasting. example fasting been around for a long time it's how sorority girls get lean or whatever they get um so uh that that's definitely a thing that happens and it's been happening every now and again with um blood flow restriction training to paraphrase my mentor dr mike stone who's been a sports scientist since the fucking 1970s he, he told us once in class that core training, you know, like as a fad, like it's all about core, right? I've literally had a woman at a party literally tell me like, so it's all about core, right? Like all the fitness is about core. Yes. Including getting bigger arms and legs. What the fuck are you talking about? But to her, it was this, everyone was talking about core and it was the new thing. Why? Doc Stone literally told us in class, he's like, core training will become a fad roughly every five years. I've been around since paying attention since the 1960s every five years core then it'll dwindle core low carb does the same thing keto uh carnivore uh however you call it uh it'll, it'll come back every five years or so and people are like because there's new people in the fitness industry and yeah. they're like this this is the new thing so with blood flow restriction training you got something similar now bfr has some pretty cool advantages with a relatively low load that is excellent if you're injured by the way but works if you're not injured you can get very meaningful amounts of hypertrophy because you restrict the blood flow to the region, it increases the amount of metabolites, it drives your motor units to get recruit the fastest which ones more rapidly because there's just nothing else and you're, you're, you're struggling to move the weight. So it can be a really good way to hypertrophy. There's a couple of things about it. One, uh, there's at least a few studies that show that it doesn't work for long durations. Your ability to, to buffer metabolites improves radically if you push that system. So the first time you get a crazy pump, crazy burn, crazy sore, the sixth time you use it, you're like, I can just keep doing this for forever. You don't get pumped anymore. You don't get really sore and you don't get a whole lot of hypertrophy. So it's more of a short run pathway you can use every now and again to spice things up. It's amazing for uh, clinical rehabilitative purposes because like it's awesome to grow muscle when you have to use to fucking half the load you normally load, do because yeah. if your knee's fucked up man you ain't squatting shit but if you do leg extensions the bfr it can actually really start to rebuild the tissues there so that's a big deal um as far as for athletic purposes because derek you said that you know athletes do it pre-game but i can't think of something there's a more stupid idea than that because bfr fatigues living shit out of your target muscle and actually as you train in bfr over time it seems to preferentially grow the slower twitch muscle fibers versus the faster twitch muscle fibers so for explosive athletes which is most athletes this is a real bad idea yeah um, athletes that train in hypertrophy have two concerns one they want bigger muscles but two they want bigger muscles to transfer over into their explosive sport training if i'm a golfer i want to fucking hit that ball as hard as i fucking can with my bigger muscles but if i develop my bigger muscles mostly through higher rep sets and even the extreme version which is bfr training um blow for restriction i'm gonna be fucking pumped and look great 
but man, my swing's just not that much more powerful versus if I work on my swing, you know, with heavy triples and uh, sets of four and five compound movements and uh, huge ballistic movements, not only do I get more muscularity, but also like, holy fucking shit, can I hit that ball? Same applies to jumping, to running and everything, especially to sprinters. Um, one of the best sprinter philosophies, I forget who this person was, I believe they were a coach at Alabama, and they had their sprinters do like two weights workouts a week, almost entirely for the lower body. They had them do uh, two times a week of training the start, a couple times a week of baton pass training, a couple of running mechanics reviews, and that's it. And they're like, do you actually have them run the 100, 200 much? Like, no, nah, we'll run it once or twice before a meet, and then we'll just run at the meet. And like, why don't you like do tons of volume? He's like, because it makes sprinters worse. That converts their fiber types to the wrong one. And yeah, there are volume accumulation phases, but the 100 meter sprinters are a very simple job, but it doesn't take very long. And you're overdoing it because also some sports, many, many sports, the amount of training volume that optimizes performance in that sport is low. And it steals the ethos of hard work away from those athletes and coaches that are practicing it. Um, perfect example, even though it's a movie, remember the Titans, you guys have seen that, right? What does he do in the movie? He wakes up as football players to do three mile run in the fucking middle of the night or super early morning. What the fuck for? How does that match the biomechanics and the, and, the, and the physiology of a football game? It doesn't. It actually makes you worse at football. If I wanted to get the team to lose more, I'd be like, gentlemen, three miles every morning, wake up, start running it. You're going to get slower. You're going to get hurt. It's going to be amazing. Why would you do that? But it hits this big green check mark in people's heads, which is like, I'm suffering. I'm training. I'm working hard. I'm challenging myself. It turns out the physical training required to be an offensive lineman is a couple of five meter sprints, a couple of position movement drills really fast, moving forward, back, etc. Technical work and lifting five or six times in the gym to become a fucking monster. And it. the rest of the time you spend resting, recovering, and fucking getting mean so you can hit put people on the football field. Taking that people minimalistic some, approach. Taking yeah, that but people approach. try to layer in a ton of stuff. They're like, they have a really great question in their minds as elite athletes. What else can I do to make myself better? And sometimes they're like, I'm going to do BFR. I'm going to do this new technology. I'm going to put the fucking, you know, the, the doohickey things and it's going to make my muscle spasm and, and my yeah, off days, it's going to really do recovery, spasm. all that stuff. And it turns out a lot of times, a lot of sport training is basic and not extensive. And the rest of the time, you have to try to reduce your total stressors as much as possible. So yeah. the ideal sprinter or American football player spends most of their time at home playing PlayStation and eating good high quality meals and sleeping 10 hours a fucking night. That's a fucking monster. Is there glory in that? Not a ton. Who has the most glory in sport training? Ultra marathon runners by a long shot. They're just doing a sport that's objectively harder and requires more training volume. And most people can't do it and won't do it. Thank fucking God, because it sounds like literal torture. If someone's like, okay, do you want a bullet through the head or do you want to go do an ultra marathon? I'm like, mm, give that some thought for a second. It's not immediately clear. Those people can put on Rocky Balboa soundtrack on loop and really get out of that ethos of hard training. But I think a lot of BFR and other things, they have their excellent context and hypertrophy work for bodybuilders. They have an excellent context for general fitness populations that want a different thing. Great context for rehabilitation, but for explosive elite athletes that aren't currently injured, it's actually going to probably make you worse at your sport. And people think, oh, if I just do more, and a lot of times sport training is about doing less rather than doing more. Right. I'm going to quote uh, my man, Bo Jackson. In, um, I don't know if you saw his documentary, Bo yes. knows, but it was really, it was actually a really intelligent thing he said. And you, you know, he turned around and goes, you know, I never understood my coaches wanted to like tire me out. I never liked yes. working out. I never yes. understood the idea of tiring me out. And it really is. I mean, like I, like I, I come from a, ironically, a, a golf background. Most people don't know that, but you know, work with a lot of rotational sport athletes and they would come in and they would almost get caught up. It's like, what's the goal here? It's to be more resilient. Yeah. They want to hit the golf ball further. Yeah. But then like suddenly we'd start having a conversation. They'd be like, you know, uh, I want apps. And I'd be like, well, what? what? Your... Yeah, they're, they're, exactly. They, I'd be like, well, what's your, what's your goal here? I think you got to understand what Does your the goal PGA is. pay you for abs motherfucker. Exactly. exactly. But they're, but they're kids. Think about it. you're working right. with a young 25, 26, 27 year old and they don't know it's not their, their, their jobs to shoot, you know, 64, 66, 63, 68 in a, in, um, in the masters. And, you know, then they're placing like, they don't know, they don't know. They just affiliate success with, you know, how someone looks and I'm like, no, yes. no, 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 no. Like the reason why you have that asymmetry fixing that might screw you up. Like maybe we don't want to do that. Like, well, let me explain to you, explain to you why. So I think a lot of it, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's, I think you're doing the right thing. What are you really trying to do in a nutshell? You're trying to inspire and educate people. You're trying to become the master source where if someone wants to learn about body composition, hypertrophy, training, 
come to you, um, which I highly recommend. I can't even begin to tell you how much how much time I, I'll I'll find myself just eating breakfast and watching your videos. I love them. I think you're brilliant. And I think you're all that. And can you tell everyone where they can find you? Because I know we've taken enough of your time up already. Dude, Don, thank you so much. Uh, Derek, thank you so much, guys. A huge honor, pleasure being with you. Awesome. Uh, all, I will say is all these things are exaggerations. I the, we're the best I can aspire to is just be another contributor of like slightly better than average advice. If I'm at 51% and above, I'm living my good, my best life here. Um, so if you want a decent take with some dog shit comedy and uh, tons of pointless sexual references then rp strength youtube is a place just type in rp strength all one word and uh go on youtube you'll see my gigantic ugly face oftentimes wearing this one of them my few walmart purchased multicolored sweatshirts and uh there i will be blabbing and hopefully you can get something out of it and if you don't my apologies i it turns out i don't know that much well i'm a big uh you know i'm a big uh supporter of you and i uh, love what you do Thank and you so obviously consider you a friend now and loved when you were out here so if there's anything we can ever do you let us know and Looking forward to connecting again, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, mate. Thanks, Derek. That was fun. Thanks, guys.